Vegans are healthiest. Carnivores are healthier. Raw milk is good for you. Oat milk is best for you. Fat-free makes you fat. Eggs will clog your heart. What should we believe and who's behind the nutrition narrative? Max Lugavere has spent the last 10 years researching how food impacts our health. Let's learn and dispel common myths. If you're not sure what to eat, you'll find this conversation fascinating. So Max, I am so excited about this conversation. You know, you're what I would call a food expert. You've been studying food, both from a medical perspective, just and even functionally. And I want to tell you that I, I'm actually going through this phase in my life right now where I'm starting to be afraid of food because mm. you have all this information coming at you on social media and you kind of don't know how to sift through what is okay, what isn't okay. And as a mom, I also feel like I'm a role model for my children and I want to share the truth with them. And I've had multiple encounters either with doctors or with experts where, you know, they make certain recommendations that don't quite make sense to me. And so I have a lot of questions. This might actually be a pretty long interview, but I really want to get into it and just walk out of this conversation with some key nuggets that can help me better understand how to be a better role model for my children when it comes to food and also how to take better care of myself, right? And you know, I have one body and body is pretty important. And yeah. so I, I hope to make the right choices. So before we get started, let's just start by talking about your background and how did you get into this world of of nutrition and food and you know genius fu- foods as you call them? Yeah, so I've I've had a circuitous path. Um, I didn't go through the traditional academic channels. I had have always been passionate about nutrition and fitness and nutrition science and supplementation and the like, more from like a, a vanity standpoint. But in about the year two thousand eleven my mother developed the earliest symptoms of what would ultimately be diagnosed as a rare form of dementia called Lewy body dementia, which is akin to having both Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease at the same time. And I had no prior family history of any kind of neurodegenerative condition. My entire family were caught completely off guard. And I was between jobs at the time. And I started spending more time with my mom. And because I am the first born in my family, and I've always had an incredibly close relationship with my mom, I took it upon myself to go with her to different doctor's appointments. And what I experienced in every instance I've come to call diagnose and adios, where a physician would, you know, run a battery of esoteric tests, usually prescribe a a different drug for my mom and send us on our way. But it wasn't until we booked a trip to the Cleveland Clinic where my mom was diagnosed for the first time with a neurodegenerative condition. And she was prescribed drugs for both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And she was very young. How old? She was 58 at the time. She was in the prime of her life. She had all the pigment in her hair. She was a spirited New Yorker. She was somebody who anybody would look at and be like, this is a woman who's really like, you know, hasn't even yet peaked. And yet here she was succumbing slowly to this condition, which is progressive and ultimately incurable. And so for me, you know, that was the a turning point in my life. I've never experienced like a stronger call to action than that. I became obsessed with trying to understand everything I could about the etiology of that category of conditions, namely dementia and Alzheimer's disease, primarily because Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. There are other types. But underneath that sort of umbrella of brain health, you have metabolic health, you have cardiovascular health, you have body composition. All of those matter when it comes to the brain. And so I didn't have the sort of academic background to really set me up for answers, but I felt entitled to them nonetheless. And so I dug into the medical literature, which we live in an incredible time. We, you know, we have access to information that prior generations didn't have. And so I dug in into PubMed and I was trained as a journalist. I had worked for a TV network for six years post-college where I was taught how to investigate a topic. Now, I'm not saying that that's a replacement for getting a PhD in nutrition, but you're taught to be a skeptic, to ask questions. And that's what I did for the betterment of my family. So I started, you know, just reading as much as I possibly could, leaving no stone unturned and cross-referencing. And ultimately, I realized that I could exploit my media credentials to reach out to scientists around the globe. And I began having conversations with them. And so that was a journey that began a little over 10 years ago at this point. And it's one that'll continue, you know, for the rest of my life. But 
All that is to say, so at this point, I've written three books really exploring the intersection between diet and lifestyle and brain health and more broadly longevity in general. I've also uh, collaborated with many highly credentialed people in the field. I even got to publish a scientific text. I was a co-author in a chapter on the prevention of cognitive decline in a clinician's handbook on the neuropsychology of aging and dementia. So I've had a ton of exposure to this field. And I don't know everything, but I certainly know a lot at this point, and uh, I'm happy to, uh, yeah, to set the record straight for you. So let's get into some of the stuff. Most of what you talk about is how food can be preventative, and much of the medical field is really focused on treating the actual symptom and the problem, and you know whether it's a pill culture or actually trying to address the actual disease as opposed to building a strong body ahead of it. And so what are the key learnings that you have come up with over the last 10 years when it comes to this preventative care? Yeah, so I mean, dementia, like, like the myriad chronic non-communicable diseases of modernity that that most people today are now suffering from. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, about 60% of people today die from these kinds of preventable lifestyle-mediated conditions. Dementia, cancer, type 2 diabetes, and the like. Preventable. Preventable, yeah. They don't develop overnight. I think that's like the most obvious, but, you know, uh, an insight that few people are willing to recognize because, you know, it gives you agency. It gives you agency to change your destiny. And you take a condition like Alzheimer's disease, which may begin in the brain decades before the first symptom, 30 to 40 years before the first symptom, with regard to Alzheimer's disease specifically. Parkinson's disease is, a, is another condition. By the time you receive your Parkinson's disease diagnosis, half of the dopamine-producing neurons in the substantia nigra region of the brain, that's the part of the brain that's affected primarily by Parkinson's disease, are already dead. So this is like we have a huge window of opportunity is how I interpreted that. And so that was the call to action for me, to try to understand everything that I possibly could, both to help my mom, but also to prevent this from ever happening to myself as best as I could, given the current body of literature. Knowing that, you know, 90% of what we know about Alzheimer's disease specifically has only been discovered in the past 15 or so years. But, you know, we do have a degree of agency and you're never too young or too old to start making brain healthier choices. So, you know, then it, it became, okay, so like what, what do we need to do? And so I started looking at different dietary patterns that are associated with reduced risk. Now, in the medical literature, you know, the Western, Western medicine lauds the Mediterranean dietary pattern, mm -hmm. which is a whole food diet that's inclusive of animal products. So for some reason, it's described occasionally as being a low-fat diet. It's not a low-fat diet. Anybody who's ever spent time in a Mediterranean kitchen knows that they're, they use copious extra virgin olive oil. It's also not a low-meat diet. They eat tons of lamb. I mean, like the Mediterranean region of the world, they've, you know, they, some, of our, some of the greatest delicacies you know, involve animal products. But then there's also copious fruits and vegetables and, and the like. So so yeah, so I started looking, you know, from a high level at, at that and comparing that to the Western dietary pattern, which is a dietary pattern that unfortunately, I mean, we call it the SAD diet for a reason, which stands for the standard American diet, but it's a, it's a diet that in many ways leaves us overfed and undernourished. You see a lot of people today struggling with overweight, with obesity, about two thirds of people are either overweight or obese. By the year 2030, in fact, one in two people are going to be not just overweight, but obese. Many people struggle with glucose regulation issues, either prediabetes or full-blown type 2 diabetes. And at least 9 in 10 people today, so that's the vast majority of people, have some component of metabolic syndrome, whether it's an oversized waistline, lipid dysregulation, and the like. So it's uh, we know that the food environment in many ways is contributing to the widespread disease that we're seeing. And that's a diet that you know, is largely, you know, processed and, and foisted upon us by the, you know, by this like vertically integrated multinational conglomerate food system. And I think it leaves a lot to be desired. And this is the diet that, that I essentially grew up on. I mean, my diet was, you know, my, the foods that we consumed in my family was, I think, a little bit more towards that Mediterranean style dietary pattern. But it was largely a fat phobic diet in the sense that, my mom was somebody who was very attuned growing up to the messaging surrounding heart disease prevention. I, growing up, I would hear it all the time that her father passed due to heart disease, which, you know, I don't actually know whether or not that's true. But, you know, if you were somebody who was looking to prevent heart disease, 
through, throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you were told to avoid predominantly saturated fat and dietary cholesterol. Right. It was like margarine, stay away from eggs, stay away from milk, stay away from red meat. I mean, I, I think to some degree, Americans are still growing up hearing that kind of message. And your point is that the problem in America is not necessarily that people are eating Twinkies and Cheetos, which is a problem. But I think the, the, the problem is also some of the misinformation that people who are trying to watch what they're eating and they're either skinny fat or they're people like your mom who really are aware of what needs to be consumed. They're not just grabbing things because they're in the mood, but what, what they're being taught to eat is actually wrong. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, I'll never know what caused my mom's condition. I can't say with certainty that it was her diet. And I certainly don't want to victim blame. I mean, my mom, mm. you know, my mom aspired to be healthy her whole life, which is the, the grand tragedy. But she of wasn't it, like obese. Of it all. She right? wasn't. No, she wasn't overweight. Right. And she was a cosmopolitan, affluent woman. I mean, she had mm. access to healthful food. Mm -hmm. But it was that message that was just drilled in, you know, and also my mom was a big animal rights advocate. And so she had certain dietary preferences that were driven by you know, kind of her ethical, her ethical beliefs. But, you know, she, she embraced largely a, a vegetarian diet. It wasn't exclusively vegetarian, but she, I never saw her eat any red meat ever growing up. And she, I never really saw her eat any eggs. And that was primarily because she was afraid of the, of the dietary cholesterol that egg yolks contain. I remember when she gave me my first omelet, you know, when she made it for me, my first like fried egg. She told me not to eat it very often because it would clog my arteries, you know. And we now know that dietary cholesterol has very little impact on serum cholesterol. So it's like, you know, for many people, for decades, they crossed out, you know, from their shopping list, a massively nutrient-dense food, like the, the egg, right? The incredible edible egg. And what did they replace it with, right? These like ultra-processed, refined grain products with added sugar, cereal. And yeah, it's become like one of the major problems underlying the epidemic of obesity and related related conditions. Can you explain that to me a little bit? You, you're you saying that actually eggs and meat and dairy are actually good for you. I mean, what about cholesterol? I went to a doctor a couple of years ago and they did a blood panel on me and the test result came that I have high cholesterol and I'm actually fairly slender and I work out. But he basically told me that I should, you know, cut down on the eggs, cut down on red meat and start eating oatmeal in order to prevent that. And so is that not in fact true? Is that inaccurate? Yeah. So it's more complicated than eating cholesterol leads to more cholesterol in the blood. The same way that when you eat fat, that doesn't necessarily equate to fat around the midsection. And over the long term, people who eat more dietary cholesterol will produce less endogenously, like in their own bodies, and people who eat less will produce more. So there's like what's called homeostasis, right? There's no one-size-fits-all diet, so everybody's different. But it was, I believe, 2020, if not earlier, that dietary cholesterol was finally removed from the, the dietary guidelines for Americans. It was no longer considered a nutrient of concern. So all the science, you know, just continued to show us that dietary cholesterol has very little, very little impact. In fact, you know, whole egg consumption is associated with positive, in some studies, positive health. It's difficult to tease out when looking at observational data if single foods are good for you or bad for you because of, well, for one, the, the, the nature of that type of research, which is correlational in nature. But then also there are always so many confounding variables that make it hard to tease out the true impact that a, that a singular food is having. Because we don't eat singular foods in isolation, right? We eat them as part of dietary patterns. And our dietary patterns tend to be associated with other habits that we might, you know, imbue with our lifestyles. So, you know, a good example of that that I like to give is with a food like quinoa. So if anybody's ever, you know, had quinoa, chances are they're, you know, they're doing better than than the majority of the population because to have quinoa, you've got to be, you've got to live in a community that has restaurants that serve quinoa. If you know how to pronounce quinoa, <laughs> you're probably reading health blogs. You probably are shopping at, at, you know, Whole Foods or a similar, you know, type of supermarket. So if you were to look at the population level, I would bet any amount of money that people who eat quinoa on a regular basis probably have fantastic health. Because they don't eat that much sugar and they probably exercise, right. et cetera. This is what's called healthy user bias. So I don't know if this study exists, but I would I would bet that people that people who regularly eat quinoa have great health. Now, is it because of the quinoa? Is it in spite of the quinoa? Or maybe the quinoa is having no effect. It's just a surrogate marker for somebody who's generally health conscious, right? Mm -hmm. 
you get the inverse effect when looking at foods like meat and particularly processed meat, right? Because what, where does processed meat appear in, you know, in somebody's diet typically? It's in, it's in the form of hot dogs. Right. It's in the form of chicken nuggets. It's in the form of Subway sandwiches. It's in the form of, you know, foods that typically come with fries and sodas. Mm -hmm. So when you zoom out at the population level and you look at the consumption of processed meat, and this isn't to say that processed meat, that there aren't some potential problems with processed meat consumption, but that's why you see generally such bad news when it comes to the consumption of those kinds of foods. So that's all, that it all comes back to healthy user bias. But when you look actually at the few randomized control trials that there are, and when you actually like break apart what, what red meat is and what eggs are, they're incredibly nutrient dense foods. I'm not, this is not my opinion. This is fact that when you take something like grass fed, grass finished red meat, it's a wonderful source of protein. In a tiny volume of red meat, you get, you know, a significant bolus of protein, of very high quality protein, rich in branch chain amino acids, which we know are crucially important to supporting muscle health. People are now referring to our musculature as a, as a vital sign, like how much muscle we carry on our bodies. It's so important for aging well. Loaded with creatine, which we know supports energy metabolism in our, in our muscles, as well as in our brains small handful of studies that suggest that when vegans and vegetarians who don't eat red meat, obviously, supplement with creatine, which is a carnitine nutrient naturally found in red meat, they see an improvement in their cognitive function. So right there, you know, we're, we're seeing that there are compounds in meat other than the protein that are potentially beneficial. It's the number one source of dietary, of, of iron, heme iron. People tend to write that off, but 25% of the global population is anemic with half of those individuals, half of those cases being due to iron deficiency. Mm. Great source of zinc, great source of vitamin B12, great source of choline. So yeah, it's, a, it's one of nature's multivitamins. Same thing with an egg. When an embryo is developing, the nervous system is the first structure to assemble. So like the egg yolk literally contains everything that nature has deemed important to grow a brain. And these are the kinds of foods that we've like, we've, we've shunned from the dinner table. Well, I mean, I think we've, we're scared of it now. Could someone eat too many eggs or eat too much meat? I mean, would you, would you say to your kid, it's okay to eat eggs, three eggs every day, meat every other day? Is that fine? Yes. I you would, would say, say it's, it's totally fine, fine overall. Yes. I've, I would eat eggs every single day. I would eat red meat every single day. Now, here's the thing though. Red meat, there's meat and then there's meat. Yeah. You know, there's excessively fatty factory farmed meat, right? Which from an evolutionary standpoint doesn't make a lot of sense from a dietary standpoint either. Because we evolved eating wild game, which was much leaner than a domesticated modern cow. Mm -hmm. Like there's no such thing as a wild cow. I think it's important for people to know that. Like cows, we've created cows, right? And they're very fatty. And particularly when you take a cow and you feed it an aberrant diet, like the, you know, the grain and the candy and the junk food that it's literally forced to eat in the factory farm system, then you get an aberrant fatty acid profile and it's as a whole fattier than it would be were it eating its biologically appropriate diet. And so, yeah, I do think that it's problematic to eat excessively fatty meat regularly, mm -hmm. particularly when it comes from that system, right? But if we're talking leaner cuts of grass-fed, grass-finished beef, then I think it's totally fine to eat every single day. What about dairy? So there's a lot of controversy around dairy, right? And also there's a conversation of raw milk versus like pasteurized milk. Yeah. What are your thoughts on dairy and butter, right? Nina Teicholz wrote a book about how steak and butter now belongs on your dinner table, yeah. which is something that a few years ago would be a huge taboo. Nobody would want to touch butter. They would touch margarine or, or other, whatever other oils, anything but butter. But now I'm hearing a lot of research that butter is actually okay and maybe even good for you. Yeah. I mean, butter, as far as oils go. I mean, oils and added fats in general are there, they tend not to be very nutrient dense and they are very calorie dense. So whether it's butter or oil, I'm, you know, I think it's, it's important to be mindful of how much you're actually using. Now, butter is interesting because when we look at epidemiologic evidence, there's this paradoxical finding that's been re replicated across numerous studies that when we see people who eat full fat dairy, they seem to have better cardiometabolic health based on various biomarkers than people who eat low or reduced or fat-free dairy. And that's paradoxical because full fat dairy, dairy is loaded with saturated fat. So if saturated fat is so bad for us, why is it that it's the people who are eating full fat dairy that seem to have better health, right? And so dairy has like unique fats. As I mentioned, they're predominantly saturated in nature. So they're the saturated boogeyman fats that we've been told to limit. But 
with dairy, they seem to be, we seem to have a, a different response to them in the sense that they seem actually neutral from a cardiovascular standpoint. They don't seem to raise LDL cholesterol. So if you have, you know, elevated LDL cholesterol, there's a pretty good chance that um, dairy fat is going to be, um, is, not, is not having an, uh, an impact on that. With the exception, actually, of butter. So butter is like this, this strange man-made creation, right? Like nature, cows make dairy, but we churn dairy cream to make butter. And one of the reasons that it's been pro proposed that we have this like different response to butter, not what we would, I guess, predict based on its saturated fat content, is that butter contains something called milk fat globule membrane, which is a mouthful. It's not the most user-friendly term. You don't have to remember it. I'm going to use it with my kids in the With your kitchen. kids, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so milk fat globule membrane, basically... It's like this bubble that encapsulates the triglycerides, the fat in dairy, which seem to actually make us not really respond to them in, a, in, a, in any negative way. And that actually makes sense because breast milk is dairy. It's rich in milk fat globule membrane that seems to actually improve the cognitive function of children and infants. So milk fat globule membrane is great. And if saturated fat was trying to kill us, why would mother nature have put it in breast milk, right? It wouldn't make any sense. So it seems that dairy fat is actually very helpful. But when we churn butter, we disrupt that membrane. And so you're basically freeing all of those saturated fatty acids for, you know, in a, just to make it really simple for people to understand, you're, you're essentially disrupting that, that membrane. And so that's why you'll actually see lipid response. You'll see your LDL go up with butter, huh. but you won't see that with cream, with heavy cream. So butter is actually kind of unique. And if I were, for example, trying to bring my LDL down if it were high and I couldn't explain it, but I was eating lots of butter, I would probably eliminate or at least cut down on the butter. So butter for me has actually become more of like a YOLO food. Hmm. But milk is still in the okay zone. Yeah, milk is great. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if I'm you're not lactose intolerant. Right. So let's remove all the aberrations and the possibility that yeah. people might be allergic to certain things. But yeah. in general, you would say that it's okay for humans Definitely. to consume cow milk. Definitely. Yeah. Um, it's a very nutrient dense food. So many people say to me, you should not be drinking cow milk because humans are not meant to drink cow milk. And even the cow only drinks it when it's a baby. And so if you're an adult, you should not be drinking cow milk. I'm sure you've heard that before. So what's your response to that? Yeah, well, the cow, I mean, there's, there is some truth to that, that there are growth factors in milk and that milk contains a lot of nutrients that are really critical to the growth and development of a neonate. But when you think about what is, you know, what is the organ that's under the most rapid growth and development at that stage in life? It's the brain. Mm -hmm. and so when you actually look into what comprises milk, you see a lot of compounds in it that are actually really beneficial to the brain. Now this, I'm not saying that we know for certain that dairy for adults is going to be, you know, protective of brain health. But if you're not sensitive to it, dairy is an amazing source of protein. It's a great source of, of myriad minerals. It's got milk fat globule membrane in it, which as I mentioned is beneficial. We see observationally that people who eat full fat dairy seem to have better health. And recent uh, meta-analyses show that dairy, again, for people who are not sensitive to it, actually has an anti-inflammatory effect. So people like to think that dairy is inflammatory, it tends not to be shown by the, the, the medical literature. We so actually where is that myth coming from, this fear of milk? Well, I think part of it has to do with the fact that there's now billions of dollars being poured into, you know, the promotion of these like plant-based milks and, yes. and, and, and dairy-free plant-based products. Like the oat milk. Oat and milk, almond milk, almond milk, things like that. Yeah, you have to understand that for oat milk to be good for you, dairy has to be bad. Right. It has to be really bad because yeah. dairy tastes so much better than the oat milk, if we're yeah. honest about it. <laughs> and I've had to check my own biases. You know, in Genius Foods, which is my first book, I don't think I talked about dairy at all. And in fact, in the back of the book, I might have even referenced it. I think I, I talked about it as something benign you could take or leave. But actually, mm -hmm. you know, over the past few years, I've really kind of warmed up to it. You know, whether we're talking about cheese, which, you know, even if you're lactose sensitive, like hard cheeses have very low lactose in it. Great source of dietary protein, as I mentioned. And we see that people like in the Mediterranean, you know, dietary patterns that are associated with better health, they consume, they consume dairy. You know, mm -hmm. dairy is a part of the, of the diet. So what are your thoughts on oat milk in general? So you're saying much of the promotion of oat milk and almond milk and all of those 
substitute milks yeah. is actually coming out of its pure marketing. I think is it, it good for you? I think a lot of it has to do with wellness industry, just like BS, you know, I, I, I honestly do. And I have zero affiliation with the dairy industry, by the way. I'll just like, pre, you know, like throw that into the mix because people will say, oh, you must be, you know. You must own a bunch of cows. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I just, you know, I realize that heavy cream in my coffee is like, I'm, I feel much better using that than some like slurry of gums and carrageenan and like yeah. fillers and, you know, rapeseed Unnatural. oil. Yeah, like, like, like refined, industrially refined seed oils that they now put in all these like, you know, fake, fake milk products mm -hmm. and the like. And, and yeah, you're just getting much better nutrition like with dairy. There's a researcher who I follow. There was a paper published in 2000, I believe it was 2020 or 2021, where him and his co-authors looked at all the most nutrient dense foods available to us and dairy was up there dairy mm -hmm. along with like organ meats and beef and dark leafy greens and things like that yeah it's a it's a very nutrient dense food and i think it's a lot it's a lot less processed right. than the vast majority of these like high margin you know plant based foods i think that there's a time and place for them like i you know i'm not, I'll enjoy the occasional almond milk latte, just like the rest of, you know, like the rest of them. And for people who, who are lactose sensitive, I think it's good to have, you know, that as an option. But like, I think many people have taken dairy off the table because of this sort of wellness, like this idea that it's not part of the clean eating paradigm. hundred percent. Yeah. And there's, I mean, look, there's money to be made everywhere. Like everybody's, everybody's like got their hand in the pie, right? Like meat, dairy, like those are industries, but you don't see the kinds of profits in those industries that you see when you have a company that comes up with a proprietary recipe for right, like an the oat beyond milk meat or beyond meat those companies are worth billions of dollars right and it's all profit yeah. it's all profit because the ingredients that they use to make these food like products are dirt cheap right like what is oat right. milk you know some like a, a, a couple of pennies worth of oats some rapeseed oil which is some like industrial you know sludge you it's know. ironic because when you think about it it's so unnatural and they're all about natural, except that they're pushing for this unnatural diet. Yeah, it's a it's a big problem. But like, I have a cat. If I feed my cat milk, she goes nuts. Like, she loves it. She's happy. Yeah, she, she knows what's good for her. And she's like a picky, right. you know, she knows what is biologically appropriate. Like, somehow there's like this innate intelligence, right? <laughs> We're going it's backwards odd. on so many levels. Right. Can I, I want to ask you about a few more items of food, and then we can get into some philosophy here. Oils. You have a lot to say about oils, right? There are, there are oils that are good for you and there are oils that are bad for you. And there are a lot of myths around oils, including, I know you have a love affair with olive oil, yeah, right? And so you say, just go ahead and pour olive oil on, on everything. Yeah. Uh, so just, I want to hear a little bit more. I mean, should we worry? I mean, all, olive oil has a lot of calories, right? Well, it does. Yeah. And calories do matter. They're not the only thing that matter. But yeah, I mean, you know, oil in general is a, is a, it's a very calorie dense food. It's not the most nutrient dense food, but one to two tablespoons a day of extra virgin olive oil, I think is a great decision to make for you and your family, because we've seen that it's, it has powerful anti-inflammatory effects. Again, this is not opinion. This is like based on meta-analyses that have looked at randomized controlled trials, population evidence, even animal studies show us that there's this really powerful benevolent effect of extra virgin olive oil, whether from the fatty acid profile that it contains or these really impressive phytochemicals that extra virgin olive oil contains, like oleocanthal, which mechanistically might share an anti-inflammatory mechanism with ibuprofen, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. But, you know, chronic use of those kinds of drugs is associated with cardiovascular events, which you don't want to happen. But with extra virgin olive oil, you seemingly get an anti-inflammatory benefit and no downside. So it's a it's a wonderful fresh fruit juice that I think people should use as the primary oil in their kitchen. Would you cook in olive oil? Because one of the things that I remember growing up with is this concept that if you overheat olive oil, it turns into some sort of carcinogen and that's bad for you? No, that's not true. Yeah, you can definitely cook with extra virgin olive oil. It's a big myth that you can't. It's at least as heat stable as avocado oil because it's mostly monounsaturated fat. And then about 50% of extra virgin olive oil is saturated fat, which is chemically the most heat stable of, of all fatty acid types. So it's very heat stable. And also it's protected by those antioxidants that it contains at temperature. So one of the issues with it, you might have a lower smoke, smoke point, and that's because extra virgin olive oil isn't just a pure fat. It contains these phytochemicals. And you might get like off flavors 
extra virgin olive oil, I mean, one of the great things about it is its flavor. It's like wonderful mm -hmm. flavor. So you might change the flavor profile if you heat at very high temperatures. But it's not bad it's for not you. Not bad. No. It's Where not does become... the myth of cooking in olive oil being dangerous come from? Do you know? I mean, I can guess that it's probably due to the fact that when you cook with some of these highly marketed, refined, bleached, and deodorized grain and seed oils, that those actually become carcinogenic at high temperatures. And so, you know, I guess like that's not the most convenient marketing message for that industry to send. So, you know, maybe we've just heard that it's like not good to cook with hmm. like oils in general. I don't, I don't actually know, but if you go to the Mediterranean region of the world, they're cooking with extra virgin olive oil. Right, they'll they fry an egg and they cook an with olive it. oil. Yeah. And in fact, when you cover meat with extra virgin olive oil as yeah. a, as a marinade, it actually prevents some of the, you know, potentially carcinogenic compounds from forming on the surface of the meat that you get typically with charred meat. So I'm a big, you know, advocate of, of meat consumption. I think the benefits outweigh any risks. But how great is it to know that you can like just rub some extra virgin olive oil on your meat, potentially reducing the synthesis and generation of these like, you know, pro carcinogens that would otherwise form at, at high heat. What are the lessons on seed oils in general? So I've heard that we should stay away from seed oils. Can you explain can you explain that to me? And then yeah. is grape seed oil okay? Because I know they use that a lot in the Middle East yeah. and in the Mediterranean. But now I'm hearing that grapeseed oils are bad for you as well. And so what is the reason behind that? So grapeseed oil was is a by, is purely a byproduct of the winemaking industry. So they used to just throw away grape seeds. And sure. one industrious entrepreneur realized that you can press them, extract the oil, run them through myriad industrial steps, and you end up with this tasteless, odorless oil that can be sold for mil hundreds of millions of dollars to be used in anything from salad dressings to spreads to, you know, granola bars and the like. And so it's part of a category of these RBD oils, which again stands for refined, bleached, and deodorized. Also, we refer to that just industrial seed oils. And in that category, you'll also find canola oil, soybean oil, corn oil. And generally, I advise minimizing your consumption of these oils, if not altogether eliminating them from your diet. For one, because they're novel foods. They didn't exist in the human food supply prior to 100 years ago. Some people listening to this might say, oh, naturalistic fallacy, not everything that's you know, natural is good for you, not everything that's unnatural is bad for you. But you know, we don't have the kind of long-term data on these oils to say with certainty that they are universally benign. We just don't. You know, we can see based on short-term studies that they might compare to, you know, certain fats lower, you know, LDL cholesterol, but, you know, what is it actually doing to the quality of, you know, of those lipids? You know, is that actually creating a, a benefit to our health or is it, you know, just happenstance? You know, these oils, they go through these, these processing steps that damage them. One of the, of the problems associated with these grain and seed oils is that they're predominantly comprised of a type of fatty acid called polyunsaturated fats. And these fats are the most chemically unstable, they're the most sensitive to heat, and ultimately the most vulnerable to damage, whether when cooking with them or being left out by the stove, exposed to oxygen for, for months on end. I mean, I grew up with like the big plastic clear jug of corn oil by the stove, yeah. right, in the warm kitchen environment. I just, I vividly remember. And it wasn't until like 2013 that I finally was able to get that out of my mom's kitchen. And so the problem is that these oils are very prone to this form of chemical degradation called oxidation, which is essentially rot. I mean, it's, if you leave an apple out, a sliced apple out on the counter, it turns brown. It's essentially rotting right before your eyes. You can't see it. It's not visible to the naked eye with these oils, but it's happening. Like you don't, you know, you wouldn't want to eat something that's rotten. Does olive oil do that? No, because it's so, because it's primarily monounsaturated, which is much more chemically stable. Huh. Um, and it's got all of those antioxidants in it. Antioxidants meaning it protects against that oxidative process. Mm -hmm. Polyunsaturated fats don't have the antioxidants. They're, they're just much more prone to that process. Now, a little bit here and there is probably fine, but you, know, you see certain contexts where it becomes potentially really harmful to ingest them, like, for example, when they are in the fryers at restaurants. You know, I posted recently, I was at a restaurant and I saw the fryer was filled with oil. These oils are dirt. They cost restaurants pennies and restaurants are notorious. You know, their margins are, are notoriously right. tight, right? And so they use the, they buy the cheapest oils that they can to fry foods in. They're generally always going to be soybean oil, 
mysterious vegetable oil. There are all those, those types of oils. And I asked my followers, like, how, you know, when do you think that this oil, like, how, what's the frequency with which you think this oil gets changed? And many of my followers who actually work in restaurants are like, oh, that oil doesn't get changed for like months. You know, we're told to just, we're told to replace it every, you know, like a couple times a week. We just, we just strain it and we let it sit there. And we just, when the oil gets low, we add well, more there oil are all to these it. sanitary laws for restaurants where they get like the A or the B and that doesn't count. I get, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly like how that, what the code is, you know, for that, but plenty of my followers were telling me that in their restaurants, those oils don't get you, but even so, like, even, even if it's a day, like you don't right. want these oils, these oils are the most damage prone and they're the ones that are being used in this setting, you know, to be held at temperature, used to fry foods in. And again, we don't know the long, we don't know the impact that these fats are having over the long term chronic consumption are having on our brains. We just don't. We have animal studies. There was a study where they took, you know, this group went to a bunch of Mediterranean restaurants and they took the oils and they fed them to mice. And they found that in mice that were genetically prone to developing colon cancer, the feeding of this oil rapidly accelerated tumorogenesis. So they, they developed more tumors. They had more intestinal inflammation. Yes. They had leaky intestinal permeability. And it was compared, it was compared to like fresh extra virgin olive oil or something like that. I can share the, the paper with you, you know, to share with your viewers. But yeah, so we don't, we don't necessarily know. We do know that regions of the world that use lots of these oils have epidemic levels of chronic disease. We know that regions of the world where they use predominantly extra virgin olive oil, they have lower rates, right? Like the Mediterranean region of the world. They're not using soybean oil in a traditional Mediterranean kitchen or even in a traditional Japanese kitchen. They're not. Japanese, the Japanese dietary pattern is also associated with robust mm -hmm. health. It's just this, this like artifact of the standard American diet that gets a pass because it's so heavily marketed. Right. And because it fits this chain of logic so perfectly where, you know, if statin drugs are good, which I'm not saying that they're not good in certain contexts, but, you know, if, if drugs that can reduce our LDL cholesterol are good, and they have to be good. They're worth billions of dollars, right? Those they better drugs, be they, good. Yeah, they better be good. Then seed oils, which also are able to reduce our cholesterol, also have to be good. Hmm. And if those are good, then animal fats have to be bad, right? Right? Because they have the inverse effect. And if animal fats are bad, well, then dairy fat has to be bad. And if dairy fat has to, is bad, then, oh, oat milk is great, you know? Right. So it's like this. there's this whole thread of logic that's being, right. like, held up by billions of dollars of, of corporate interest. And it's like nobody has stopped... Well, not nobody, but like very few people stop to just step back and be like, whoa. I mean, I actually think that as you think through it, it makes sense, but it's hard to think through it when you're inundated with marketing from every direction. Plus you have the American Medical Association really towing that same narrative, right? You don't really have doctors coming out and saying, hey, you know, it's okay for you to eat eggs. It's okay to feed your child milk. It's okay to eat olive oil, but you should stay away from these seed, seed oils. I, I think there's just a lot of confusion. The other area where I think there's a lot of confusion for parents in particular is around the cereals and oatmeal and then granola bars, right? Yeah. I I have a I have a big issue with granola bars because when I eat granola bars, I feel like I'm eating a cookie. Honestly, my body reacts the same way when I eat a granola bar and a cookie. I I think it's basically the same thing, but I can't tell you how many people put granola bars in their kids' backpacks with the assumption that it's something that's healthy for their child, right? Granola. Granola is supposed to be healthy. Yeah. I mean, they're just like dessert bars these days, just loaded with added sugar. And sugar is an interesting thing. I mean, it's, there's nothing inherently toxic about sugar. Like our bodies are well adapted to be able to ingest and handle, store, burn off glucose. But it's the problem is today that we're just, we overconsume it. I mean, we overconsume pretty much everything today. We overconsume unhealthy fats. We overconsume added sugar. We overconsume so. We're just, we're swimming in an environment where, you know, your average person today, unfortunately, is overfed and undernourished. Mm -hmm. um, but these kinds of like snack products like granola bars, they're just adding insult to injury because generally, you know, loaded with added sugars, loaded with unhealthy oils. And it's a big problem. Like today, kids should be given, you know, like they, they should, we should be prioritizing healthy fats, you mm -hmm. know, for our children. We should be prioritizing protein, like, like fish, eggs, you know, animal products, things like that. And instead, we're just, you know on top of all the candy that they're naturally going to eat, right? You know, we have these like candies essentially disguised as health foods. Right. And that's the bars. Yeah. It's the bars. Yeah. yeah. Or the cereals, you know, I mean, it's just right. all 
aside from the food compass, which we'll talk about in a little yeah. bit, I think parents are generally aware of the fact that these sugary cereals are bad for their kids. But they do think that if they feed their kids oatmeal or a granola bar, that would be a healthy alternative. And you're saying that it is not the case. It's better to actually give them a hard boiled egg or boxed yeah, milk. Or yeah, fruit, fresh fruit, vegetables, I think are fine. But but yeah, I mean, you know, it's it just goes back to the 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 problem with ultra processed foods today, that we just we tend to overconsume them, right? Your average adult today, sixty percent of the calories that your average adult consumes comes from these ultra processed food products that line our supermarket aisles. They're shelf stable, and usually loaded with added sugar, bereft of any real nutrition, low in protein because protein is expensive. You know, mm. so when you dilute a food product of its protein, you're increasing margins. Mm. essentially. And for children, that proportion is even higher. 70% of the calories that your average child consumes today comes from ultra-processed mm. foods. These are not natural foods. These are foods that you couldn't recreate in your own kitchen if you tried. And so, yeah, it leads to, it leads to problems. I mean, it leads to nutrient deficiencies. It, it, it you know, may lead to hyperactivity, so much sugar, you know, mm -hmm. like being, being. What are your thoughts about fruit? Can, can people just eat fruit? Is, is that something that you're worried about? Is it, is, should think, we, you know, not eat too, I mean, it still has sugar in it. Yeah. But as part of a, as part of a diet that includes an optimal amount of protein, I think whole fruit is great. And I think it's great primarily because it's self-limiting, you know, mm -hmm. like I personally, like, you know, I'm a big fan of whole fruit, but after eating one apple, I don't feel compelled to go and eat another apple. It's not like a bag of chips that is specifically right. made with the dopamine experience of trying to yeah. Basically, binge. Oh, yeah. Binge like, eat. like uh, even as a kid, after eating one of those granola bars that comes in the green pack, I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to like name them, but like the, you know, those green that the ones somehow that we crumbs, buy at Costco. Yeah. The crumbs end up all over you. You're like, what just happened? I want to eat another pack, another package yeah. of those. But fruit is self limiting because of the fiber, because of the water, because of the mineral content. It's slowly, you know, it's slow digesting. Like if you eat one whole orange, you tend not to want to go and rush to eat a second orange. Right. So yeah, whole fruit is great. So the whole food pyramid is basically upside down. Things that we were taught to eat a lot of, we should eat very little of, like these grains and, you know, fat-free, fat-free snacks, right? And eat more, you're saying eat more of the, the high fat food. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it, it necessarily, pro, part of, I think, one of the problems with the, the demonization of fat that we've seen over the past few decades is that the pendulum is now swinging the other direction where, you know, we have people who now have adopted these very high fat diets. It's like the Atkins diet? Yeah, the popularity of keto and things like that. So you see people putting butter on everything and you see people eating excessively fatty meats. I don't think that that is good for you either. I think mm. that, you know, there's definitely something to be said for leaner meats. And I don't mean lean with, with all of the fat removed. That's not what I'm saying. But, you know, optimizing for protein, and getting those healthy fats and the various micronutrients that they contain, but not going overboard with it because, you know, we're not, we don't live in an environment where food scarcity is a pressing issue the way that it was for the vast majority of our, of our evolution. We've solved the food scarcity problem. Now we live in a time of food abundance. Mm -hmm. It's the first time in human history that, that we're living in where your average, where we have more overweight people walking the earth than underweight. So we've solved the problem of food, of food scarcity for the most part. But yeah, you know, like I think once you become once you become like aware of all the sources of both added sugar and added fat, you realize that your average American is just eating too much of everything. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like I, when I buy ground beef, I buy, I'm buying like ninety to ninety three percent lean because I mean you're still getting plenty of fat, you know, to mm -hmm. make it satiating, to slow digestion, to get all those important nutrients. But you're increasing the protein calories, which is what's really important today in an overfed environment. It's the protein because protein is what supports our musculature. Protein breaks down into amino acids that provide the backbones to our, the, the precursor molecules to our neurotransmitters, all of the enzymes in our body, like our, every, everything. Like pro, our bodies are made of protein. And arguably, most people are under-consuming protein, not to the point of, of deficiency. Like there's, there are very few instances of protein deficiency in the Western world. But arguably, we're not consuming optimal levels of protein. So that's, I think, my where I've shifted my thinking as I've, I've really, you know, become more mindful of like the protein and optimizing for that. And that would mean more chicken and more fish too? 
Yeah, I mean, I think chicken is is great, free range chicken. Fish is obviously super important, particularly from the standpoint of the brain. It's hard to argue against the benefits of fish consumption, particularly fatty fish like wild. What salmon. about the antibiotics in those products? I mean, you're getting antibiotics in farmed fish, probably, but you know, I think still the benefits outweigh the risks. You know, for people who live in, for example, food deserts where you don't have access to the most pristine... Can you pristine... explain food deserts? And yeah. I want to talk a little bit about that as well because people will say, well, we're having this elitist conversation because we can go buy organic food. Yeah. But most people can't afford that. And, you know, really the question is, does the majority of America, are they obese because they live in food deserts and they don't have access to the type of food that you're recommending? Yeah. Well, food, I mean, no, food, food equity is like a real problem. And I think like things are improving. Part of that is, I think, you know, one of the great things about the world that we live in today is that people have access to, for example, free content, free podcasts, where people can mm -hmm. like get this kind of information for free and share it and, and, and act on it. But food access is still an issue where there are parts of the country where people are still, you know, left to shop for their groceries at gas stations and 99 cent stores. That's a real, that's a real issue. But things are changing where, you know, 10 years ago, you wouldn't have found grass fed, grass finished beef at Walmart. And today you can, you can find organic at Walmart. You can mm -hmm. find organic not that you need organic, but, you know, you can find grass-fed, grass-finished, or wild fish at Costco. Right. Um, or sardines. Or right? sardines, you, yeah. You highly recommend yeah. sardines, right? That's not that expensive. <laughs> I think sardines are great, but I guess there, there is a learning, a learning curve. But, yeah. But no, salmon, wonderful source of omega-3s. And the benefits of, of eating it, regardless of where it comes from, seems to outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. Like, most people in this country are not eating pristine, wild you know, wild-caught fish. They're just eating whatever is available. And we see that people who eat more fish tend to have reduced risk for Alzheimer's disease, even if they're genetically predisposed. Their offspring seem to have greater cognitive abilities. So, yeah, the benefits outweigh. Would you say that eating whatever fish you buy, like whether it's with antibiotics or not antibiotics, is it better to have that fish than to have like a bowl of grains or a bowl of pasta? That's yes. a tough one, right? Yeah, no, I think it's definitely better. I think it's like you know, we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good. And again, the vast majority of foods that your average person are, is eating today, it's these ultra processed foods. There's a, a photojournalist, people can Google this on, or you can maybe like put it up on Google Images, looked at your average family's like weekly grocery haul in the United States. And they also did it in the UK. And, and so it's this, this family around like their week's worth of groceries. And you can see, you have to like squint and look like, take a magnifying glass to find the fresh food. Like most people are just consuming like, ultra processed packaged convenience foods, mixed dishes like pizzas and things like that, burritos, like fast food. That's what people are eating, like sun up mm -hmm. to sundown seven days a week. And so I think any improvement from that, and this is backed by the by the literature, you're gonna see, you're gonna see a, a beneficial effect. But yeah, salmon, eating a piece of farmed salmon instead of boxed mac and cheese for dinner, I think that's, I mean, that's a great choice. That that right there is like a choice that, you know, you'll see a positive effect from. Hmm. So I know you obviously recommend overall trying to go for the more natural. Do you have any thoughts on organic food versus not organic food? I mean, organic food can be really expensive and sometimes not really accessible. What are your thoughts on organic food? Yeah, I mean, I think that w when in doubt and if it's available to you, you, you know, might want to opt for organic when it comes to fruits where you eat rind or the peel or the whole vegetable itself. So for example, dark leafy greens, berries, kiwi. I actually like to eat the skin on kiwi. You eat the skin on kiwi? So Ew. good, yeah. There's actually a lot of like Not nutrients. So the um, the <laughs> outer part of a fruit yeah. actually is where you get all of these interesting compounds that like polyphenols and things like that, that have that that probably have a really significant health benefit. Wow. Yeah, and so if you're shaving off the peel of your kiwi, yeah. I do, it's a mistake. and I love kiwis. No, eat the whole thing. People people are like, well, the fur on it is gonna feel weird. It doesn't. Yeah, it's, it's like It's tart and delicious, yeah. Wow. Super good. So bananas, avocados, things like that, I never buy organic. But also like, I think it's important for people to realize that organic is not a panacea. And that, or the organic industry isn't perfect, but what you are doing by buying organic produce, it's not more nutritious, mm -hmm. but you are reducing your exposure to synthetic pesticides, mm -hmm. which I think is probably valuable. There were meta-analyses that show that organic also has higher levels of these, like these plant so-called defense compounds that might have a benefit to human health. But if it's not available to you or accessible or it's too expensive, I think people should not feel in any sense, nervous about buying conventional produce. Hmm. And when it comes to animal products, organic tends to be a more environmentally 
sound, and also with produce. I think it, organic also makes a lot of sense from an environmental standpoint. From a health standpoint, yeah, if, if you want to maybe, you know, like split the difference, buy organic when it's something that you're eating the skin or the peel or the rind or whatever. And then you can buy conventional for all like the other avocado stuff. Like yeah, avocado or banana. Avocado, oranges, right. things like that. You know, conventional. It's so interesting, the term organic, because I can think of all these boxed processed foods that have that label organic written all over it. Yeah. And you would be like, no, just don't eat that stuff in general, right? Because right. it's processed, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you find, pro- you find organic candy. Right. You don't want to major in the minors. You, in the, the big picture, you want to reduce your consumption of these ultra-processed foods, whether it's candies or cakes or cookies or what, right. what have you, Right. And ultimately, like, if you don't have access to organic, then I think that's fine. Just, you know, rinse your fruits and vegetables well. You want to do that with organic anyway. But I think for peace of mind, for me, it makes sense to buy organic when I'm eating the skin or the peel because I just don't want to put my health in the hands of these multinational conglomerates, mm. you know, and the, and the synthetic herbicides and pesticides that they peddle. No thanks. Imagine you're traveling through the airport right now and you don't have food with you. What snacks would you grab? Well, I'm a huge fan of nuts. Nuts and seed consumption is associated with better cardiovascular health, better neurologic health. We know that nuts are a great source of healthy fats, fat-soluble antioxidants like vitamin E, minerals like magnesium. So I'm a huge fan of nuts. I also, you know, if I find like a low-sugar beef turkey or something, mm. you know, I'm, I'm all about that protein. I think protein, protein also is the most satiating of the macronutrients. So, you know, when you're looking at carbohydrates, protein, and fat, it's pretty easy to overconsume carbohydrates and fat, particularly when they're combined. You know, mm-hmm. we call it the Dorito effect sometimes. Like when you combine carbs and fat, it's like this delectable. So yummy. Yeah. It's like when you look at all, all <laughs> of our junk, junky snack foods, they're all some combination of carbs and fat, right. right? They're depleted of protein, which I've mentioned. And so I like to, I think, opt for protein instead because it, it assuages your hunger. It, it settles your hunger in a way that carbs and fat just can't. So it's beef jerky, it's hard-boiled eggs, beef sticks, things like that. Uh, Greek yogurt is a great snack. Um, Mm. And also vegetables. You know, you can find like little baby carrots and things like that. A lot of us have picky eaters as children. And, you know, they just want the pasta. I mean, is that something we should stay up at night worried about? I mean, is it, could a kid grow out of their pasta only phase and start the healthy diet later on? I mean, is is this long-term damage? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, piss off the parents that are watching and I'm not a parent. So, you know, I don't, I don't know the best, you know, best practices for getting a kid to eat more, you know, whole foods, but, uh, you know, there's no doubt that, that whole animal source products and fruits, fresh whole fruits and vegetables are going to be a better option than pasta. But, you know, maybe it's a portion thing. Maybe you give a little bit of the pasta and then you make the, the center of the dish you know, the egg or the whatever the, the protein of choice happens to be. Yeah, so hopefully they'll grow out of it as soon as possible and just get them onto a healthy diet. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think it's about just modeling that behavior mm-hmm. for your children. You totally. know, like if you are the kind of person who would settle for, I mean, and everybody's busy, you know, so not to like, you know, minimize the fact that people have like real obligations. Sometimes you just want a quick dinner. and But there are quick, healthy meals that you can eat mm-hmm. as well. But if your child is seeing you eat pasta for dinner, yeah. That's not setting them up for healthy habits in the in the long term, you know. Right. And you got to start early, modeling this behavior as early as possible. Absolutely. But I know a lot of people, like adults, like grown humans, who have what I would call a twelve-year-old boy diet, and they're eating, you know, hot dogs and French fries and sodas right. on a regular basis. Like that's those are, and they have they have underdeveloped palates. They just like very pleasing you know, non-complex flavors, you know, mm-hmm. they like, like the most basic, they've, they've just never evolved their palate. Right. And, you know, sometimes when I spend time with their parents, like I see, well, that's where it's clear where this came from because the parents have a 12 year old boy diet as well, <laughs> right. you know? So you just have to like always be modeling, always, at, always pushing them to challenge their, you know, their, their preferences and things like that. I do this myself. I, I routinely, you know, if there's something that like, I'm like, oh, I don't like that. I'm like, well, why don't I like it? Maybe I was in a bad mood when I tried it the first time, or maybe I right. tried it 15 years ago and my palate's changed, you know? Always be willing to challenge your preferences. Yeah. Life is too short to, you know, to die by, you know, something that you right. tasted 20 years ago. Right. And give it another try. Yeah. With the kids, I with my kids, what I do is I have them kiss it 
then lick it and then try it. And so they might be willing to just, you know, that's just, cute. you know, just give a kiss to that little broccoli yeah. and see if that's okay. And if they survive that, then they can move on. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. That's a little trick. Yeah. I love that. Where is this food compass coming from? The, can we talk about the Tufts University food compass? What happened there? Was it just some silly mistake that someone made? Is it a nefarious thing where you have these big companies paying researchers to come up with research and then brainwash the rest of Americans? I mean, even an eight-year-old would look at the food compass and see Lucky Charms at, at the top of it and eggs at the bottom and yeah. say something looks wrong here. Yeah. What, what happened there? Yeah, like you said, I mean, even an eight-year-old could, would look at that and, and like, like what, it, what is going on? So the Food Compass, it's the latest nutrient profiling system to be devised and to gain wide, widespread traction, put out from the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts University. And it drew a lot of fire recently because it analyzed dozens of thousands of different food items in the supermarket with this, u- utilizing this algorithm that ranked foods in accordance with, you know, based on how much protein it had, how much fiber, the degree of processing, its, you know, saturated fat content, obviously docking points for, for saturated fat. So it came up with these scores for all of these different foods in myriad different categories, dairy, animal products, grain products, and the like. And when you looked En masse at these scores, you might think to yourself, oh, well, they did the work, you know, this is like, you know, maybe this is hopeful. But one separate group looked at the scores and noticed this, that something was really weird, actually, about the scores. That when you were to take foods from different categories out and juxtapose them, you know, one next to another, the scores actually made little to no sense. And so this chart that went viral showed that, for example, Lucky Charms and Frosted Mini Wheats had higher, vastly higher scores according to the food compass, than foods like a poached egg, which is just an egg, basically, or ground beef. You'd see egg substitute fried in vegetable oil ranked higher than an egg, which makes zero sense. Like zero, there's zero universe in which Lucky Charms are better for you than a whole egg. So, I mean, right there, as you mentioned, like a five-year-old would look at that and be like, right. this is off, right? Criticism against that chart that went viral is that, well, foods, you know, the the foods weren't meant to be taken out of their respective categories and juxtaposed one next to another, but that's exactly what they were intended to do. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a score, right? Right. The score was there. Why why is anything scored? So that we can rank them, right? Right. So that we can compare. So that's just a completely asinine criticism to this, to to the viral chart. And in fact, when you go over to the Tufts University website, they did the exact same thing. So my argument is if your own institution is misrepresenting your work, then, you know, then it's actually not being misrepresented at all. And so, yeah, the food compass is just like the latest of these nutrient profiling systems. But the people behind it actually have a lot of weight when it comes to policy. And there was a recent, in September, back in September, there was a White House, you know, conference on nutrition. It was like one of the first conferences on nutrition that the White House has held, to my knowledge, in years. And the creators of this of this system were there, and you can see, you can clearly see how they intend it to be used as, you know, as something to influence front of package consumer purchasing decisions. It's intended to be used by food manufacturers to, in you know, inform consumers. So it's a it's a massive problem, and yeah, there are conflicts of interest abound. Um, right, and ultimately, kind of these charts make it into the education system, and yeah. you know these situations like you know, like your mom. I mean, this will happen again because we're getting, you know, wrong information. And it might yeah. not be Lucky Charms versus a poached egg, but it might be that oatmeal story, right? Oatmeal versus grass-fed meat, right? Yeah. And 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 that's kind of how these this you know really misinformation comes out to yeah. to the public, right? Yeah, it's pervasive. I mean, the 2020 Nina Teicholz, who you referenced earlier, mm-hmm. she was one of the authors on a paper that looked at the all the all the people who were there at the 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans Committee. 95% of them had conflicts of interest with the food industry or big pharma. 95% of them. It's just insane. Hmm. We saw recently that the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the largest governing body of our dietetics industry, right? Wow. Nothing against dietitians, but they not only take gifts from the food industry, but they have stock in junk food companies. Wow. So they're vested in the success of these junk food companies, right? And they're very influential. Right. They don't, they don't, 
write the guidelines, but they're very influential. We saw recently there was this big thing, people were up in arms about it, rightfully so, that a highly credentialed physician went on 60 Minutes and claimed that the primary cause of obesity is genetics, right? So you can't do anything about it. It's all genetics. It's all genetics, right? But like if you look at the ads that were placed in between that show, it was all right. for semaglutide, right? Or like, oh or for, you know, for drugs, essentially. I mean, we know now that there's this big push, right? for even children now to get them on this, you know, this semaglutide right. peptide, which is, you know, the GLP-1 agonist that's shown remarkable weight loss in, in obese people, but so long as you're on the drug. Right. Right? And of course, that's not even to accounting for the, all the side, side effects and the long-term, you know, effects that we have yet to fully elucidate from, from using that drug. I mean, the culture that we've created now really does not celebrate personal accountability. All the things that you're recommending, you know, you know, check your labels, you know, buy fresh food, eat fresh food, make sure that what you're putting into your body is preventative. It does require quite a bit of discipline, yeah. right? You also talk about how important it is to work out three times a week, which also requires a lot of discipline. But our culture is not pushing for discipline. Our culture is is really pushing for, you know, a pill fix, right? And so when you see these these billboards of of people who are frankly obese, and that is supposed to be the new standard, you know, whatever people think is beautiful, that's, in, you know, that's for them to decide. Yeah. But it's obviously unhealthy to be heavy set. It's Over, yeah. obviously overweight is unhealthy. And we have our children looking the, at those billboards and saying, yeah, that is okay. Right. And they're like that just because it's in their in genetics and it has nothing to do with the fact that they're, you know, over consuming carbohydrates and sugar and all of that. And then we have an industry that is basically paid off by a, a larger industry to propagate that. And so the concept of self-reliance, take care of your body, exercise, eat healthy, is becoming, you know, more of a fringe, more of a fringe within our culture. And I think that is ultimately so dangerous, so dangerous that we're raising a generation that doesn't believe in personal accountability. A hundred percent. And then you have somebody like this who's, you know, highly credentialed, well-respected researcher saying that obesity or genetics. I mean, imagine like the, 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 the people, how people in this country, you know, where again, one in two people are obese, heard that, you know, that, right. well, I guess I'm just overweight because of my, my genes. I might yeah. as well go, might as well go and get the shot, or, you know. Or it'll do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And she, this, this woman, you know, like, and this is not, per, not, not personal, but like she's now, she was just brought on to Biden's team for the 2025 dietary yeah. guidelines for Americans, yeah. right? So what is what, what role does a woman who believes that obesity is primarily due to genes doing on a dietary guidelines committee? It just, it, it doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't make any sense. You know, th this is tied to this, but not entirely, is, is another thing I heard you talk about is mouthwash and fluoride. Yeah. So that's another big industry where I can't tell you how many dentists I've seen or I've taken my kids to the pediatric dentist and I do see the mouthwash over there. And one of the things that I noticed that you talk about is actually it's not good to use mouthwash. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Mouthwash, I mean, occasional use is fine. You know, I don't want people to be terrified of using mouthwash. We're afraid of everything. We're afraid yeah. of all the seed oils no, and all the that's toothpaste. Not, <laughs> they, people shouldn't be afraid. People should be empowered. Right. And... The thing about mouthwash is that when you swish with antiseptic mouthwash, you're nuking the microbiome of your mouth, your oral microbiome. So we now know that we have bacteria. Our bodies are teeming with bacteria. Parts of ourselves once thought sterile, we know are rich with a, with a, with a microbiome, essentially. Mammary tissue, our pancreas. We know that there's, there's bacteria in us, on us, everywhere. And our, in our, our mouths are no different. And we've co-evolved with this bacteria. So this bacteria, the fact that the bacteria is there, it's not happenstance. It's like, this is, this is a relationship. We need it. We need it. Yeah, this is a relationship that has endured millennia. And there's a symbiosis there. And so what we're seeing is that our oral bacteria are involved in the nitric oxide pathway in our bodies, which helps to promote healthy blood pressure and help support healthy blood flow. And so there's this line of research that is not yet definitive, but that suggests that frequent use of antiseptic mouthwash puts us at increased risk for type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Mm. 
which makes sense because nitric oxide is a signaling molecule involved in insulin sensitivity, which is not there in the setting of, of type 2 diabetes. You have widespread insulin resistance. And then hypertension. So nitric oxide, as I mentioned, is important for helping to maintain blood pressure, you know, healthy, healthy blood pressure. And so we see that people who like frequently, two or more times a day, who swish with antiseptic mouthwash are at increased risk. Now that's observational. So correlation doesn't equal causation. But then yes. mechanistically, there have been a number of studies that have shown that just an acute rinsing with antiseptic mouthwash actually can increase systolic blood pressure. Not by a huge margin, but that there's an effect. And then we've seen that when people use antiseptic mouthwash, prescription mouthwash, chlorhexidine, in the post-exercise setting, that some of the antihypertensive effects of exercise are blunted. So mm -hmm. exercise, we know, is one of the best ways to support healthy blood pressure. It's one of the most amazing benefits. I mean, there are many benefits of exercise, but everybody should exercise, you know, if for no other reason than to support healthy blood pressure, which we know is crucially important to brain health. And exercise works as well as drugs. That meta-analyses show this, that exercise is just as effective as drugs for helping to normalize blood pressure. Even light exercise, right? Even just going on a walk yeah. a few times a week, right? Just movement. You know, mm -hmm. if you can't get to the, I mean, if you're, if, you know, some people are so overweight, they, you know, exercise is like this, this, you know, it's like climbing a mountain. Mm -hmm. Just movement mm -hmm. is, is, is wonderful. And so what this study has shown was that when you take two groups and you make them exercise and one swishes with this antiseptic mouthwash mm -hmm. in the post-workout setting, that the benefits to their blood pressure is actually like blunted. Wow. It's not altogether It's negated. so bizarre because in so many fancy gyms, you see the mouthwash available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so well, the way it works, strange. Yeah, the way it works is, and also, you know, a lot of the, some of the most beneficial uh, compounds in plants, like dark leafy greens, which mm -hmm. another very nutrient dense food category. I, you know, love to promote that people regularly consume dark leafy greens, whether like kale, kale, spinach, arugula, super healthy, super nutrient dense, but they contain compounds called nitrates, which are oral bacteria. People have heard of nitrates in beets, for example. Yes. So beets are another great source, but dark leafy greens are also rich in nitrates. We don't have the enzymes to convert nitrates to nitrites, which then enter this nitric oxide pathway, which boosts blood flow. So we literally rely on oral bacteria for that. That's the symbiosis. If you were to sterilize your mouth and eat beets, you wouldn't get any of the nitrate-mediated benefits wow. of beet consumption, right? Or it would be dramatically reduced. And so, you know, we rely on oral bacteria to extract the full cardioprotective benefit of our food and so if you're, if you're routinely like 40% of the country nuking your oral bacteria with mouthwash, then you're doing your health a major, a major disservice. And we need more research to, to really like identify the specific types of mouthwash and the, and the frequency, you know, but something that like, I think, especially if you're a frequent user, hmm. you should definitely reconsider that, that habit. Well, that definitely makes sense. There's, I know you say do your research and you've done your research. I think sometimes it can get overwhelming because where do you do your research, right? If you just go, go on Google, yeah. you might land on the Tufts food compass, which yeah. is not a good research, right? Yeah. And so when, when one says do your research, what do you recommend? And also, I know you've done a lot of research. Is there a way where people can follow your research to learn? I mean, there are a lot more details that I couldn't ask you in this specific interview, and I'm sure more people would want to know about it. Where can people go? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think people should get familiar with PubMed. You know, not every article is open access, but it really does help to support scientific literacy to just read as much science as you can. Not everything is going to make sense, but I think going into the references, cross-referencing, because that's actually one of the things, one of the ways that I learned early on was I would, if I didn't understand something, I would just go to the like the references of the article, and I would I would cross reference and see how other scientists talked about the same topic. I would just, you know, reference and reference and 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 read and read and read, and you know, ultimately things start to make sense. And also to not be afraid to ask questions. Like nobody knows everything, mm -hmm. so it's uh, yeah, it's super important. So PubMed is a, is a great resource. Early on in my journey, I actually became friends with somebody who had who lent me their academic credentials. And so for years, I was able to log in like through university and download all the research papers that I wanted, which was great. Not everybody's going to have access to, to them, obviously, but there's a lot that you can read. There's a lot that you can read. And then the other thing that I think is, is really helpful is to 
read the press releases that often accompany studies. So oftentimes the way, I consider myself a health and science journalist, and the way that health and science journalists usually interpret science is they will receive the press releases and then just write about the press releases. Mm -hmm. But you can cut out the middleman by going straight to those press releases and then reading those, which is usually put out by the university, and then also read the study that the press release is referencing, and then try to make sense of the, you know, of what the press release is telling you that the study said, and also what the study is actually saying in scientific terms. And so that's something that, you know, the more you do it, the, you know, the greater your scientific literacy will become. Mm -hmm. But for me, I host my own podcast. It's called The Genius Life available on all podcast platforms, also on YouTube, just search The Genius Life. And I'm very active on Instagram and Twitter, at Max Lugavere. And, uh, and yeah, my books are out there for... Right, you have a... You yeah. have, oh, this book is great because it Thanks. helps, really helps you understand what's going to power your brain in a yeah. better way. It's a little intimidating because there is a lot to change in the way we currently live our lives and, and the type of diets that we hold. But I think that what's very helpful is that you also have a cookbook. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you kind of don't know how to get started, you just start with some recipes. And so I, I think it's great that you have this cookbook. I, I enjoy cooking. It's, it's a hobby of mine. And so I look forward to reading this book and coming up with some new fun recipes. If you had, just to send off everybody who are listening to this, if you had three pieces of advice just how to get started, because I think it's really difficult to take a giant garbage bag and throw your entire kitchen into it, though yeah. one wants to do that when finishing your book. What would be your three last pieces of advice for, for people who just want to get started with a healthier lifestyle? Great place to wrap it. So I think for one, do your best to shop around the perimeter of your supermarket. So most people don't realize this, but supermarkets are designed the same. Supermarkets, the fresh perishable food tends to be around the perimeter of it. And it's the aisles where you find the ultra-processed foods. I'm not saying that there's nothing good in those aisles. There certainly is. There's spices. There's, you know, extra virgin olive oil. There's vinegars, legumes and things like that, dry goods. But by and large, the perimeters where you'll find the grass-fed, grass-finished beef, you'll find the wild fish, you'll find eggs, you'll find the produce, fruits and vegetables, things like that. So that's one. Number two, I think it's really wise, especially in today's obesogenic food environment, to prioritize protein. Food manufacturers deplete food of protein. It makes them more expensive, you know, higher profit, higher margin. We've talked about this. Protein is super important. None of us are protein deficient, but arguably we're not consuming optimal amounts. You know, a lot of people, as we've talked about, overconsume ultra processed foods. But just in general, you know, as you get older, like people tend to want more comfort foods and things like that. You know, I mean, I remember. When I was a kid, like my mom would serve me dinner. It was like a bowl of pasta with like, you know, butter or pesto, you know, so there's mm -hmm. marginal protein in that, if any. So prioritize protein, like the, the, the base of your plate should be, you know, whether it's fish or beef, whatever your protein of choice is, I don't care, but you know, make it that. And then fill out the, you know, the, the remainder of your plate with, with non-starchy vegetables, you know? And if you're exercising regularly, if you're active, go for the starchy ones as well. You know, there's nothing wrong with a sweet potato, you know, some white rice I'm a fan of occasionally, but, but yeah, animal products and vegetables, I think are, you know, that's really it to me. I mean, it's like, it's the most balanced we've like, we've co-evolved with our foods, you know, you know, the nutritional establishment will be like, you know, don't eat a restrictive diet, but then they turn a blind eye to advocates to like veganism, you know, which, which cross out huge swaths of nutrient dense foods. And I think it's really important to have both plants and plants and animals. And then I guess the final thing is just, just, you know, like be kind to yourself and, and, and treat yourself like, you know, food should be good. It's like, you know, it's, it's not just fuel, right? Food is how we communicate with one another. It's how we show love. It's how we bond. And so enjoyment is a big part of that. Learn how to cook. You know, I, that's one of the reasons why I wrote Genius Kitchen, which is my cookbook. It's culinary literacy, like health and science literacy, is something that we've outsourced. Mm -hmm. But I think the more you can cook at home and invite your kids to the kitchen to the process as well, you know, make them like your little sous chefs, mm -hmm. you know, s helps to solidify healthy habits, helps to increase nutrition quality, irrespective of what even it is that you happen to be cooking, just cooking at home. 
and yeah, wins all around. So I think, yeah, those three things. All right, I love it. We'll get started. We'll have to do this again where I ask you I'm about down. chocolate and wine. Yes. Uh, or people can just follow your, uh, your blog. Don't. But I look forward to having you back. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.